with so many podcasts out there, shows can get lost in the shuffle. That's why we implore you to check out Too Many Captains. You can find us at a moviepodcast.com. Five unique takes on Hollywood movies and culture. Find us on Twitter at It's a Film Podcast. Check our intellectual deep dives into theatrical films. Find us on Instagram at Too Many Captains Productions. Unique takes on soundtracks. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Too Many Captains Productions. Find us at a moviepodcast.com on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. And now, here comes a new episode of Collateral Cinema. I'm Bo Maddox. And I'm Ashley Chancellor. And this is Collateral Cinema Season 5. Welcome to Season 5 of Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters, where we focus on good movies, bad movies, and everything else in between in the world of cinema. We're podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas, and yes, my friends, we are a 420-friendly podcast. So whatever you have, be it dabs, blunts, bongs, or joints, smoke it if you've got it. What's up, Ash? Hey! Damn. Another year, another season. I've got a really good feeling about this one. I'm I'm really, really looking forward to some of the movies that we have coming up this season. Oh, yeah. We have a very interesting schedule. I, I think that I have actually uh, shared it once on Twitter. Yeah. And we are actually going over quite a few different movies. I mean, let me bring it up here real quick on my phone here, which is being an absolute asshole. No, here it is. And, and keep keep in mind, I mean, in particular, I mean, the order of, of the movies and even to some extent what movies we talk about is subject to change at some point. Oh, yeah. But, I yeah. mean, if there is any sort of change, then obviously we'll communicate that. Yeah, yeah. We'll be sure to communicate that on Instagram and on Twitter and whenever we record as well. I mean, we'll, we'll be sure to include that information. But yeah, I mean, we're we're kind of putting our uh, movie choices together. We're going back to a bi-weekly schedule. So what we're doing is we're having two episodes a month and maybe one director's cut or an at-the-theater movie, as it were. And we're going to have more or less like theme months. Yeah. Each month is going to have its own theme. Now, of course, this episode right here, episode number one, is Jörg Butgerite's Necromantic. Fuck yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that here in a little <laughs> bit. Yeah, because that happened. And we're going to be getting into a lot of interesting movies with a lot of interesting people. We're going to have Stu from SWO Productions on our Scream episode, which is coming up later on this month. We're also going to review Halloween Kills when it comes out. I'm already hearing some interesting reviews about this movie. It it came out recently. It It was screened recently. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to that because I remember when we went to see the original Halloween 2018 movie. That was a blast in in the pre-COVID days. In the pre-COVID days. Yeah. God damn it. We were going to do Halloween Kills last season, actually, and then it got delayed. Yeah, it got delayed because of COVID. So, you know, here we are. We're going to be doing it, probably watching it on Peacock or going to the theaters. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, we're both vaccinated and we both have masks. I mean, come on now. Next month, we're going to be doing the Star Wars prequel trilogy. Fuck yeah. Oh, my Lord. Are we sure that we want to dip our toes into this bullshit? Um, <laughs> I actually, I love the prequels, all right? The prequels I, are I some love, of the... I like the prequels, too. I'm just talking about, you know... The fan base? The fan base. Oh, my Lord. We're dipping our toes into Star Wars fan base again. Well, yeah, that's going to be fun. That's going to be a lot of fun to deal with. And I think we're going to have the Spy Hards podcast on those two episodes we're going to record them back to back yep and that will be interesting and then we're going to have a bad movie month in december this is probably as far as we're going to go i'm going to announce a christmas episode and 
you know, we'll talk about the rest after we're done with the movie. We're going to be doing Bolero. You know, we, we've done the uh, Bo Derek movies on two of the awareness a that mm-hmm. Victims and Villains put on. We live streamed. We did Ghost Can't Do It and Tarzan the Ape Man. I mean, I don't know if they're recorded for posterity. So, I mean, I don't know. We may have actual lost media there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're getting on that bandwagon. And yeah, we're doing another Neil Breen movie. The Breenius is back. Double down. Double oh, Down is going to be all kinds of yeah. fun. I actually kind of love that movie a little more than uh, Faithful Findings. Than Faithful Findings. Yeah. yeah, Faithful Findings is classic, but Double Down is just, that establishes the Neil Little Breen style. <laughs> and our Christmas episode is going to be with Captain Nostalgia of Victims and Villains, uh, the aforementioned Awareness-a-thon hosts. And that's going to be, um, I don't know, this is going to be a testy one. I don't know. Not, not, not with Captain Nostalgia, but possibly with, you know, a certain subset of people. It's the last ounce of courage. A straight up war on Christmas movie. <laughs> yeah, we're going there. I'm, we're going to have fun this Christmas. It's going to be fun. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Cap. <laughs> um, but, I mean, he, he's gracious enough to come on and talk about that movie. It'll be interesting. I am looking forward to it. I, I'm looking forward to it as well. That's going to be very interesting. But we're going to go ahead and save the rest of the movie schedule for last. And we're going to go ahead and get into Jorg Butgerite's Necromantic. Now, Ash, I showed this movie to you recently for the first time. Uh, Robert was here with us. He's unfortunately not here right now. And what did you initially think about this movie? Well, I didn't come into it completely blind. I, I kind of already read a plot summary, but it, it still is something to behold. I mean, you really can't believe it until you see it. It, 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 is, it must be seen to be believed. <laughs> um, I mean, this movie has it all, man. Yeah. It, it's got necrophilia and it's got necromance. Well, it's a movie about love. It's a movie about, about love between a woman and her corpse. Uh, yep, and isolation and loss and also other such themes you know themes corpse of, fucking yeah, yeah lots like, of like, corpse, corpse fucking, fucking. G- jesus christ i'm trying to say that there's some artistic merit to this but it, it's like yeah there, there's corpse fucking here ba- bathing in guts oh my god yeah it, it's it's a very gritty movie needless to say it was made by Yord Bucharide, who initially it was not a director by trade i understand he was Something entirely different. I, I I don't remember what his job was. He pretty much yeah. made this movie specifically to piss off the West German censorship board. Yep. It, it was. This is a <laughs> rebel movie right here. And the, the irony of it is that it's all about love. It's love and death. Just every, everything that pertains to death is also pertaining to love. Like, for instance, their uh, little collection that him and his uh, girlfriend Betty has in, right. their, in their apartment it's like eyes hearts even a fetus you know in, implying you know parenthood and r- procreation and it's fascinating in the artistic sense but we're not gonna really pretend that it's a great movie i mean it, it definitely stands for something it's not just you know shock horror for the sake of it you know this is not for instance the serbian film you know, obviously this is all allegorical, so... Yeah, and I mean, like I said, Jorg Butgerite, he just kind of kind of sort of lucked into making this movie. He's made a short movie called Hot Love before this, and he made a few other student films, but he actually managed to get barely a budget together to make this, but he wrote out a script. He, I think he's a co-writer of the movie, and he just like really wanted to just go over the top with what he could show. And he started making the actual corpse that's used in the movie. It's pretty much just a, you know, a fake medical skeleton, or at least I hope it's fake. (laughs) I I hope it's fake. And, oh, my Lord, he just, you know, had to find an actress that would, you know, be willing to do this all this shit with this corpse. And after a few auditions, and yes, they had an audition with this shit. Can you believe that? So they auditioned uh, for this, the audacity of it. Can you imagine just showing up, having no idea what this is about? I know. It's like, you want me to do what? And this was a no-budget <laughs> film? It was pretty much a no-budget film. He barely got any money together, but 
you know, they still put a lot of love into the actual effects work. I mean, there's footage of, you know, them, you know, directing and producing the movie and everything. And, you know, they're having a blast whenever they're doing, like, all the effects work, you know, like uh, anything, re like, requiring blood or, you know, like any type of uh, fake beheading effects or whatever. I mean, they look like they're having a blast when they're doing it. Although, from what I understand, uh, Doctari Lorenz and uh, Beatrice M., they didn't particularly like each other during the production of this yeah, movie. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, they really, really kind of went after each other a little bit. And it just really actually kind of elevates their chemistry together on screen in a way, because eventually Jorg and the other producers, they got together and they said like, look, you guys can't keep doing this. You got to patch this up. We got to make this movie. And, and they patched it up and, you know, they gave very passionate performances, needless to say. Definitely. And apparently Dr. Lorenz also did most of the music in this movie. And I think Jorg Brutgerite, though, I think that he did the main love theme for Necromantic, which I don't know if anybody has ever heard this song. It's so amazing because of what is going on on screen when it's yes. played. <laughs> but there, there's footage of the Necromantic premiere where Jorg is actually playing the theme on a piano for, okay. the, for the crowd and everything, which honestly, it looked like a really, really fun premiere. It really I'd did. I imagine so. But yeah, I mean, there were aspects of the Necromantic shooting that was, you know, a little rough. But it also looked like there were moments where they were just having a blast doing it, you know? Just so much fun going on and even some camaraderie there. I know? imagine so with, with, you know, the transgressive subject matter and just, I don't know, maybe even the thought of like, you know, what am I doing with my career here? But like sort of it just kind of binds them together. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Jorg pretty much really went in all in on his explorations of death and everything. Like his next movie after this was a uh, Der Todes King or the death King. And that's basically like seven vignettes related to death. Mm -hmm. And it's all tied together by this really interesting special effect where a corpse is just kind of decomposing in high speed and everything. And it's, it's an interesting movie. I, I absolutely implore people to actually watch that movie. It's an interesting, it's, it's even more artistic than necromantic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, I mean, the production history of this movie is just that. It's a lot, looked like a lot of fun, and it almost kind of had a little Evil Dead vibe to it, you know? Just a bunch of friends getting together to make a movie. But, I mean, yeah, like I said, the cast, you know, Dr. Lorenz, he plays Rob, pretty much the main character. Like, he's actually very interesting in this role. Yeah, it, it's really hard to get a read completely on him for a lot of the film, but overall, I got the impression that a lot of what he's doing is basically for Betty, you know? And it's the links that he's willing to go for her more so than his actual interest in this stuff, but... You know, then she leaves him behind and he's stuck with this and, and he doesn't know what else to do with it. But finally, there is that ending scene, you know? Yeah, that ending scene, which we will get to here pretty soon. But I mean, and also, like we said, Beatrice M., very, very brave actress. I mean, she just went into this. Who else were they going to find to do this with a fake corpse and somebody who they despise? I don't imagine a lot of people would be willing to. I, I wouldn't imagine so. And and, I mean, the, the love scene itself is just so brilliant. That's know? probably the best part of the movie. <laughs> it's the funniest part of the movie. I mean, this is really a black comedy in many ways. And, and you're playing this, like, lighthearted love beat in the background, you know, and they're literally fucking a corpse, and, and they cut a piece of PVC pipe, but they stick it in the corpse, and she rides it. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and it's just like... Oh, wow. We're going to have to put a trigger warning at the beginning of this. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Yeah, th this is really, really crazy subject matter, people. And it's gushy. It's gushy. It's so gushy. It's so wet. That's one thing I got to give props to them for is the practical effects here. Not only with, you know, the corpse that they made, but also early on in the film. I mean, if you look closely, you can see what they're doing, but it still looks really convincing. And, 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 and it's where uh, after the car accident where the woman's bisected. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting special effect. And on the uh, disc, I think we watched the uh, behind the scenes featurette and it, and it showed how they did, did it. And it's pretty much just a classic, you know, magical trick, pretty much. 
You know, it's a special you know. effects where they just, you know, put a blanket over her, like like a foil blanket over her lower half, covered it up with the ground and everything, make it look like it was part of the ground, and then just put a bunch of gore effects at the bottom, and she just played dead. And, yeah, I mean, for having a really, really low budget, it's really interesting how they pulled all this off. It, it, it's very obviously fake. I mean, even though I think that they did a pretty good job on the actual corpse effect, I mean, especially just kind of displaying how funky and disgusting it is, all slimy, and when one of the eyes is fucking falling out, and... You know, which was, by the way, a pig eye that they kept using and was almost rotten to the core when he had to suck it out of the of the of the eye socket. Oh uh, yeah. yeah! Oh man! Apparently, yeah, that was that was an actual that was an actual thing that he did. Yeah, that yeah. was an actual pig's eye that an he actual did pig's that eye. With. Uh, that doesn't. That, that's not much better than than a human eye. Yeah, not much better, really. No, and also that's another thing. This movie not vegan at oh, all. Oh yeah, they straight up use actual stock footage of a rabbit getting. Uh, yeah, it's that's the more unsettling part of the movie. It was unsettling for me before I went vegan, but now that I've been vegan for about like four or five years, it doesn't get any better. It really doesn't. Like, another example is like any of the cannibal movies, like especially Cannibal Holocaust. Yeah. I still have it and I'll still watch it for its historic value. And I don't believe in censoring it. I mean, I, I believe that it, no matter what, you should watch it like uncut with the animal killings yeah, because it, it, it's a document of why we should never allow that to happen again. Well, like, uh, you know, never it, again. Right. Exactly. But it's interesting with the uh, the rabbit scene in particular, though, because you know, I'm watching it, and even I'm kind of perturbed by it. And I'm not vegan, but, you know, just watching this actual slaughter going on, it's not something the average consumer gets to see. And, you know, it doesn't change my views on it or make me want to not eat yeah, yeah, an animal ever. But, you know, I do have a little bit of that reaction to it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think any sensible person would. There's even a simulated animal cruelty against a cat. It's simulated. I mean, they, they even showed how they made the uh, cat body. It, it, it was a very cheaply made effect, honestly. Yeah, yeah. The cat was obviously fake. I was like, no, they didn't actually kill the kitty. Okay, No, of course they're not going to do that. Come <laughs> on now. I mean, the, the, the rabbit thing was stock footage. The I rabbit mean, thing was stock thing. footage, I mean, that's, so... That's something that nobody can really help there. It's like, that happened, that the rabbit is dead. That's what happens to animals when they are processed for meat. That's right. what that is. And yeah, I mean, the the scene where he has the cat in the bag is distressing, even though it's fake. <sighs> yeah, even and, so, it's it's distressing. But I mean, the, the fakeness of the actual cat corpse that's used in the next scene is just very like disarming. <laughs> honestly, it, it goes back to being kind of funny because it's like, oh, OK, yeah. And, and apparently the, the he he goes up and grabs like this cat's guts, which is apparently just scrambled eggs with red dye all over yeah. it. Yeah. And just covers himself and starts scrubbing it all over himself in the bath, which mirrors a previous scene where Betty was taking a blood bath, pretty much, or a bloody bath anyways. Right. It's like, oh, where, where did she get the blood? Does she smell like iron afterwards? I know. She, that, that has to smell metallic as all hell, really. Jesus Christ. I mean, and, and what is this? Uh, that's some uh, Erzbad bathery thing? I mean, what the fuck? Yeah, I don't know. That's yeah. They, they they live a very interesting lifestyle, and I like how they sort of just show them in their own individual lives, and this is completely normal for them. She's in bloody bathwater, and he's just sort of nonchalantly watching a television show about phobias. Yeah, and about phobias, and and that's what seeks into the footage of the rabbit being slaughtered, and then juxtaposing that with him doing a not so convincing autopsy on somebody, <laughs> on just a random body. It looks like he's just pulling strands of some type of sinew out of him. It, it, do, it doesn't look good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't get us wrong. This movie is very grainy and doesn't look all that good, you know. 
and the acting is a little funky. But I think that in many ways, it's the script that kind of saves it a little bit. Just the actual flow of everything. I mean, it's a very short movie. No, so, it I doesn't mean, take long to get there at all. Yeah, so, I mean, you're going to have some very quick pacing. It's, it, it gets from A to B very quickly. Yeah, and, and you kind of feel like you really didn't need more time in B than you thought you did, so. Yeah, well, a lot of that was because they had to change many aspects of the script as they were going due to, yeah. you know, logistical factors and everything, like what was feasible, what wasn't feasible. Right. And they were just completely, you know, just kind of at the whim of whatever situation they were in, whatever location they were filming. Right. But the script, it's Jorg Bucherite, and I forget the other guy's name. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll, find, we'll find it here real quick. They really kind of found a way to approach this subject matter in a way that's extremely romantic. The threesome scene is very soft, and it has that iconic horror music theme that's just pure romance. It's like almost mm-hmm. melodramatic romance. Yes, it like, is. Like, it really is. It's, it's a very oh, melodramatic. Oh. Is, it, it, it is what? Yeah, exactly. It's pretty much. It's pretty much a, to, a Tommy Wiseau move, right? <laughs> <laughs> to me. Yeah, it pretty much is. It it has that same cheesiness to it, but it's actually a really well arranged and well performed song. That's the thing. Is this really really beautiful piano piece and this gushiness is happening. Gushy. The gushiness and the eyeball uh. and, and and the sliminess. Oh God. <laughs> You can't help but laugh. Is it intended to be funny? Is it? I think in many ways it is because. Okay. Because it's just so over the top. Animal cruelty notwithstanding, the actual story is pretty funny. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, the animal scenes are pretty much like the hardest scenes to get through in many sense. And the rabbit scene does come back later on in the movie at the end of the movie. And that, that is the scene that is also incredibly iconic about this movie other other than the threesome is the ending where after he has murdered two people sleeping with one of them after death he goes out to a field he frolics like a goddamn lunatic (laughs) and then he goes back home chooses a knife lays on his bed whips out his penis (laughs) and just proceeds to stab him while the necromantic official theme is playing the love theme oh fuck he's getting that death nut yeah oh yeah he ejaculates first regular semen and then straight up blood like antichrist style and 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 they're playing the rabbit scene in reverse yeah which it's kind of like he's unraveling all that trauma and it's kind of going in reverse as he is slowly dying it just keeps going back and back and back in a way in a sense it's reversing his trauma and allowing him to come to a complete understanding of himself and you know, if you think about it, it's the real logical progression, right? You know, yeah. there's corpse fucking and then there's <laughs> ejaculation <laughs> masturbation. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Ejaculation suicide. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a very confusing scene, but a very notably elaborate and very well balanced scene, I think. But it's the next logical progression of that. The, it is. Do you see what I mean? Like, you you go from having <laughs> intimate relations with the dead body to, you know, dying while orgasming. And then becoming the next person's dead body crush, which happens in Necromantic 2. It's a lot of Necromantic 2, yeah, right? Yeah, because at, at the end of this movie, there is the scene of uh, Robert Schmetke's grave, and you just see a shovel pierce the grave and then a high heel shoe push it into the ground. And... That's like, oh, shit. Oh, and presumably Betty, but... No, it's actually not Betty, but there is a reference to Betty coming back to his grave, like looking to steal him. It's like, I almost kind of wanted that to happen more than Monica, though. In, in Necromantic 2, I, I kind of wanted Beatrice to kind of reclaim Robert. That that would have been interesting. Yeah, well, you know, I think at the time that Necromantic was made, that was what was planned. You know, you're meant to assume that that's Betty. Yeah. They just decided to kind of go somewhere with it. Did uh, York Bootgerite even do the sequel? Yeah, he did both movies. Okay. They're both his movies, and I think he, he, he co-wrote both movies as well. Even so, like I don't, I, I don't think at all that was the original intention with the film. I think he he took that scene and then he he expanded it and wrote on it. And decided, you know, what if I introduce this other character and you know we just get 
Beatrice as, I guess, a cameo role. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's actually a good joke. It's got a punchline and everything. It's, it's actually really funny. Other than that, in Necromantic 2, there's a lot of really boring scenes, though. Although I do like the relationship between the two main characters. It's actually very endearing until it gets very violent later yeah. on but yeah the ending scene of this movie is very obviously the the effect is obviously very fake and they actually showed in the in the behind the scenes how they did that it was pretty much like a plaster cast with a fake dick and that could shoot cum and everything <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is a not safe for work episode ladies and gentlemen i mean homeboy's packing so it makes sense hey yeah i, I guess so i mean uh, yeah, I guess Beatrice was kind of, you know, satisfied somehow, I guess. I don't know, other than... And it wasn't all corpse fucking. But she ended up running away with the corpse, though. See, she's a gold digger, oh, but in a different man. sense. It's not about the money. I mean, money's necessary to, you know, financially be secure, but it's about what can be brought to her. And, and she's got the corpse now. She doesn't need him. But, you know, I'm thinking, girl, where are you going to find another man that's going to do this with you? That's going to go corpse fucking with you? Oh, she can just do bad all by herself and just get the corpses herself. That's what she can do. I mean, I guess that, so. That's what she tries to do. She does cheat with him. Oh, yeah. Definitely. She, she, she cheats with the corpse. Yeah, that happens. There, the, uh, there is a solo scene with uh, solo Beatrice scene. M and the corpse. He's and, not around. Oh, different. yeah. Different. He's, he's very different. Yeah. And other than that, I mean, there's some kind of superfluous scenes as well, I kind of feel. Yeah. Like, actually, the scene where the guy is murdered by his neighbor, which actually yes. gives us the corpse, it's comical in its own right, but it also kind of is eh for me. Because, I mean, it, it, it's even missing some of the gunshots. What is the point of that scene? It's, like I said, it's getting from A to B, you know? It's just, you need a corpse for these two creeps to have yes, sex with. Yeah, and so we have to find a way to provide that. So that that's how it's provided. It's just the way it comes across, it seems so non sequitur, but... Obviously, you know, they do end up using the corpse, so. Yeah, and you never see the dude that dumped the body ever again in the movie either. No. And <laughs> it's just so, like, like the way that that's filmed is just, you know, he, he shoots the guy and he's like, oh. He's he like, takes a sip of his beard. He's like, huh. <laughs> Motherfucker, what? are you going to drink like, a sip well, of your beard? What the hell did I just do? <laughs> Come on, dude. <laughs> and then he just nonchalantly puts it in a wheelbarrow and just fucking rolls it down the alleyway. It's like, oh my lord. It's like somebody had to see that. They certainly didn't hear it because there were no gunshots. So that's that true. Was, yeah, that that's a little oversight on the sound editor's side. But anyway. Objection! Oh, no. There was no gunshot! <laughs> Oh, yeah, Ash is on a Phoenix Wright kick. I've been playing the shit out of the Ace Attorney trilogy on my iPhone, so. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All kinds of fun, I guess. <laughs> I, n I don't know. I never really played Phoenix Wright. That's a little. Uh... I never did either. I just I just started it, and it's fucking great. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I might have to try it. I, I think I might have some on my PlayStation Classic modded device, so maybe I might try it. I don't know. But anyway, this movie has an interesting legacy to it. It's pretty much a cult movie now. I'm proud to have both copies of Necromantic and Necromantic 2. I have both those movies. I mean, even though I mean I feel that the second movie has its flaws, it seems a little too... What's the word, man? It's just too plotting in some way. Okay. It's, it's very plotting, but also it's very direct. And the end scene is actually kind of unique in its own right and, right. and it kind of has a little twist to it it's like oh homegirl what the hell well and it's like what can you do with necromantic like what can you do with the plot of that and stretch it out into a sequel like what can you do over it i'm not entirely sure other than where they went with it where they made the next movie more of a relationship drama which to me, it kind of makes it analogous to Takashi Miike's audition. Yeah, You know, okay. it starts off as more of a love story, and then it d just devolves into madness. Although, in many ways, there's points where the necrophilia is played straight, and then there's points where their relationship is played straight, you know? Because she's really trying to hide her obsession from her boyfriend and just trying to... She's trying to choose between living a normal life and, you know, living as a necrophile. And then there was a comic book that was afterward that we just found out about. Yeah, it's it's pretty much as close as a third sequel as we're ever going to get to Necromantic to make it a trilogy. And oh my lord. So convoluted. That was such a convoluted movie for something that started off so simple. I mean, that, that, that is kind of the good thing about the script of the first Necromantic is that it's a very simple movie to get into. It's actually 
downright accessible, dare I say. <laughs> you know, it, at, at least for disturbing movies, you know. Yeah. If you want to introduce somebody to disturbing movies, this could be a gateway movie because it's just so silly in so many it's ways. It's silly, you know, and it deals with just a disturbing subject matter in general, but that's it. I mean, it's the taboo of it. But it does it in a way that's very lovingly done and yeah. actually shows it's not a healthy relationship, but it's a relationship. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, needless to say. Well, you know, corpses can't consent, Bo. No. No, they can't. So. Nope. Not cool. Not approved. Not cool, man. Necrophilia? Canceled. Not approved by, by collateral cinema. It's canceled. It's canceled. We, we canceled Necromantic. <laughs> We've canceled. Canceled. For glorifying corpse fucking. And animal abuse. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Jorg Bootgerait, he went on to make, of course, you know, Der Todes King, but he also made another movie called Shram, which is another kind of short and disturbing film. But that, that's more about a serial killer who actually he, he starts the movie like he's dead, like he okay. fell down and, as he was painting and he bumped his head and it was enough to kill him. But it goes into his life up to that point, and he kills a few people, and he also gives himself a little surgery down there, self-inflicted. Oh, no. Yeah. But it's actually another example of how Jorg Bukharaj can make a movie that has a good, quick pacing that gets from A to B and still entertains you. Because it, it, it's also, I, I think it's actually shorter than Necromantic, possibly. Okay. Like it, it might actually be at least a good like ten or fifteen minutes shorter. Like I want to say that it, because Necromantic was is barely seventy minutes. Right. Like you could blow through that like easily. I think that there's literally like Nightmare on Elm Street movies that are actually longer than that. Oh, but look what it is. Oh, it's Earthlings. Oh no, I have that movie. I know. Oh damn it. That's why I showed you, man. Are uh, you bastard? <laughs> you you bastarding bastard. With oh YouTube my God. running in the background about like I, I we're, yeah, it's actually showing uh, disturbing movies. Yeah, we're watching the horrible reviews most disturbing movie list. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it, it's a series that was uh, started by horrible reviews and he pretty much kind of set the standard for disturbing movie YouTube. And mm -hmm. you know, I mean, without him you wouldn't have your Wendigos, your Nick's Fears, your Spooky Rices. Okay. You know, you you really wouldn't have people like that. But yeah, in his breakdown of Necromantic Spooky Rice, mm -hmm. like that's actually the most entertaining out of all of them. I mean, he he he's just like, "Oh, this is messed up." He's yes. just, this, this shit's messed up this oh, entire right. time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and his reaction to it is actually kind of classic. So I actually highly recommend that. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, it was great. But there's a lot of different interpretations about some of the scenes in this movie overall. Okay. One of the theories is is that it's mostly a representation of German culture, period, and German history. You know, th this is what it's meant to allegorize. Yeah, the theory states that it's meant to be an allegory about Germany's 
years between World War One and World War Two, And it also has themes of sheer apathy from the masses, mm-hmm. you know, to, to such like to suffering, like a complete indifference to suffering and to violence. Because there's a scene in this movie where Rob goes to a movie theater, buys a beer and a ticket, which is awesome. I mean, you can dr- <laughs> get a beer and just sit there in the theater and drink it, which I think you can do in many places now, yeah. like at Alamo Draft House and whatnot. But oh, yeah. I love going to the Draft House and having a beer. Oh, yeah, definitely. Having a beer and a movie. Beer and a movie. Hey, hell yeah. Good combo. <laughs> or an old fashioned. Yeah. Like, but no. not old Not old fashioned. Oh, not, not that movie. Not that one. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Screw that movie. <laughs> Old fashioned. God damn it. Ugh, God damn it. Yeah, I'm looking at that shit right now and it is just bullshit. I can't believe I have it in my collection. It's almost it's almost the same bane of my existence as Master of Disguise is <laughs> by this yeah, point. It is that bad. <laughs> but yeah, I mean the dream sequences are very interesting. They have some symbolism there. I mean, just kind of more of this melding of decay and flesh with very loving romantic experiences, you know? Like, he has that dream where he pulls himself out of that body bag, and he's half decayed, and he starts frolicking with this woman who brings him a severed head in a box, and then he starts playing catch with the head with her. Would you say it's kind of Lynchian? Maybe a little Lynchian. At at least the dream sequences are. Right, the the dream sequences specifically. I think, I don't think that it's directly, because you have to remember Jorg Bucherite, he kind of, you know, he he wasn't a director by trade or a movie maker by trade. Right. But yeah, that dream sequence is interesting. I think that's just really his longing for his relationship with Beatrice. Right. I'm kind of surprised that she didn't show up in his dreams, which is interesting. It's actually like a much thicker blonde German lady, and she's playing catch with him and <laughs> it's very dreamlike and it's very ethereal but it's also very sweet in a way but also kind of sad because yeah. you, you know it, you can tell what he's going through because he's asleep because he tried to kill himself he like tried to overdose on pills and liquor and everything and that's the result right there but he's not successful in killing himself then and I think that after that, that's when he actually goes to the movie theater. And, and yeah, the, the movie theater scene, they show this slasher movie that is just terrible. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, and, and the audience is just completely apathetic to it. They've become so desensitized to the subject matter that... Yeah, and, and that's kind of going into another theory about it, which is the main theory that we spoke of earlier, and that's the idea that it's really a commentary on censorship of the Western German government. And that scene right there, it's just kind of emblematic of that. You know, it's Mm -hmm. emblematic of more of just a straight up apathy towards, you know, everything that Germany had done at that point. Right. As far as, you know, censoring their media and everything. Because the German censorship board was really, really rigid at that point, especially in the 80s. This came out in in the late 80s. It was like it was originally in 1987, came out in 1988. Maybe that was around the time the video nasties was starting to become a thing or they already were a thing. And this movie is definitely one of the video nasties, I believe. Because, yeah, like hell, they they were going to allow that. They mentioned video nasties, actually. So that was already a concept because they're mentioned in movie. Yeah, yeah. On the television program, talk about the phobias and everything. Yeah, but that slasher movie, I mean, I don't know if there's any real inherent meaning there other than just total fluff that everybody is just completely bored with anyway, so it's like, what's the point of censoring it, you know? Right. What, what, what's the point of even taking anything out of it? Nobody cares. That's really the point there. And it's almost like a little meta commentary on Necromantic itself. You know, you could almost think that that's just kind of how the German public reacted to Necromantic, as a whole they're just like either uh or meh but i mean as far as other types of symbolism i mean maybe there's something there after what happens after the love scene where they just immediately see a big old slab of disgusting steak and they're cooking it and then they sit down and eat it and it's like wow that's such a mood whiplash you know because now they're just very happy and they're Mm -hmm. sitting there and they're eating their meat and 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 the corpse is just dripping and, and, you know, the yeah. blood is dripping off of it onto the floor and they're just they keep uh, alternating between the shot of the corpse and, you know, the shot of them just living their everyday life. Yeah. It's like normalcy versus degeneracy. Yeah. In many ways. I love the way that those shots are juxtaposed. And also the fact that they have the corpse suspended up on the wall next to a porn layout. <laughs> yeah. 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 Kitties. Back in the day, you had to buy your porn in a magazine and you had to take it home. 
You there there was none of the porn hubs or the brazzers or anything like that. Damn. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it really was. And, and, and a magazine's just not the same as a video. No, of course not. It never was. Well, there always was video. That's there was much, videos. That's pretty though. much why the internet exists, is just porn videos. That's pretty much why why it's there. Mm-hmm. And, and degeneracy and the dismantling of <laughs> democracy and whatnot. But anyway. <laughs> Ash, what are your final thoughts on this movie? I think that we can go ahead and see into that because we still have to discuss the other half of our season after this. Yeah. Well, Necromantic is, again, it is definitely the movie that needs to be seen to be believed. It's transgressive to just the extreme, but at the same time, I don't think this is one of those movies that I'm just like, you know, that most people can't watch because it's almost played for laughs. You know, it's done in such an over-the-top way that, like you said, I mean, it is a perfect introductory film for anyone that's, you know, trying to get into the more disturbing side of cinema. In that respect, I think that it, it's much lighter and this can appeal to a much wider audience. Yeah, like we said, animal abuse aside... And that's, abuse that's, aside. that's unfortunate. I mean, like, like I said, that stock footage, what can you do about that? Right. You know? The making of the film didn't contribute to that. So, yeah, you know, but yeah, I mean, I, I it, it's hard to say what you really feel about Necromantic. Because <laughs> it, it's a movie that really elicits a certain type of response from you, both emotionally and psychologically in many ways. Because, yeah. you know, I mean, you just have this assault of the senses, like especially like the way that the love scene is shown. You know, they, they did kind of have to obscure it a little bit with a lot of shaky camera work, which was very disorienting, but also added to the romantic nature of mm -hmm. the scene but i mean my final thoughts on this movie i don't even really know how to feel about it anymore <laughs> i yeah. mean it gets funnier every time i see it once again animal abuse notwithstanding and even so I, i've seen it so many times right now you know i'm i might be just that kind of jaded it's just, and I'm not trying to be like an edge lord or anything. It's just not that fucked up to me. It's just more hilarious in many ways. Yeah. And the only unsettling part is the rabbit scene and all of that. But I mean, the ending scene is great. You know, I mean, that is kind of the money shot, needless to say. <laughs> and I do like your Bootgerite's heart. And I like what he put into this movie because. Yeah, like we said before, we were watching the behind-the-scenes featurette, and other than, you know, what was happening with Beatrice and Doctari, it looked like a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It really did. It looked like these were a bunch of friends that got together and had fun making a fucking crazy, gushy crazy movie. Crazy-ass film. Yeah, and, and just going all out with it and just sitting there middle finger to the German censorship board and also, Fuck you know... Yeah. Even trying to seemingly add some allegorical elements to it. I mean, this movie was made with love. And, and I think that's why I'm <laughs> It okay. was made with love. I, I'm, all I'm, the corpse fucking. All the love and all the corpse fucking and, you know, yeah. But, yeah, it it's something that I can still go back to. I can show it to people and maybe even just get a laugh off of showing it. it, it it's a good, like, response movie if you want to get a response out of somebody. It's like a party favor. It. It, it's, it's a party movie in some senses, even. <laughs> like, if you want to just sit down and watch a, watch a crazy, dumb horror movie that might have some more significance to it than at face value, Don't you know? Don't fucking watch this on acid, though. No, I do it on a lot of weed. A lot of like, weed. Smoke lots of weed before you watch this movie, definitely. Maybe mushrooms. I don't know you even know about mushrooms, dude. I, I, I don't know. It's not. It's nothing that's really that much of a downer in this movie. I mean, unless you take the downward spiral, right? You know, at face value and everything. But it's a movie that I'm proud to have it in my collection. But it's like it's not something that I'm gonna watch all the fucking time, right? You know, it, it's something that I really just wanted to bring it to the podcast because it's unique. It, it adds something different to the horror genre. And, you know, Bukharite, he's made some great movies after that. You know, they still kind of have the same grainy quality, but his ideas and his writing get a little better over time. Yeah, you, you see a real improvement in, in his work. Because, he, he, like I said, he was a first-time filmmaker here. He didn't have any experience directing a movie. Never had any intentions to be a film director beforehand. No, no he didn't want to even be a, a film director, and he just kind of lucked into it, and he made this little movie right here. Just to make a point. Just to make a point. <laughs> and I can fucking respect that. Hell that yeah. is absolute fucking respect right there. Yeah, straight up. It's like, Jörg Bukharite, you are all right. 
(laughs) (laughs) Oh, my Lord. Well, our other half of this season, we're going to have some other very interesting people and interesting movies as well. Like we said, we're going to have, you know, themed months and everything. January is going to be our action block, more or less. Mm -hmm. We're going to do Last Action Hero which we will have hindsight movie reviews joining us on that one. And we have Born to Run, which hopefully we'll have Robert on that because that's his movie. That's a car movie. That's just, you know, a tradition and everything. Hopefully we can get him on that. And then the next month is another anime two-parter. We're going to have an anime month again. We're going to be doing Cowboy Bebop the movie with the Retro Anime Podcast. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait for that because, oh my Lord, we've been watching Cowboy Bebop watching ever since it. we did the Adult Swim episode. And oh man, that that show is still so killer, and the and the live <sighs> action so movie good. is going to. I'm I'm so hyped about that. It's going to be at least somewhat decent, I think. That anime is so good. I get to see the movie. I'm the, still part way through the anime, but yeah, the movie is actually very well done. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think that it's kind of placed somewhere in the middle of the Cowboy Bebop timeline. Somewhere, I think. I don't think it's a prequel or anything. It, it already has the crew together and everything. Like everybody's there. Ed's there. Bay's there, you know, Ayn and all of them. Right. So so it's well after they've all come together and made their own little family unit there. Makes sense. But, yeah, that's going to be fun because we're also going to do Princess Mononoke. Which was one of my suggestions. Oh, yeah, Princess Mononoke is great. I have that movie right up there. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's one of the only Studio Ghibli films I actually haven't seen yet. You haven't seen that yet? No, really? that's why I suggested it. I wanted oh, to do something. damn, dude. I wanted to do something I hadn't seen before. Yeah, I get, I get you, man. And, and I've been meaning to see it. And that's a hell of a movie there, man. I mean, conversely, there's not a whole lot of Studio Jubilee movies that I've really watched, you know? Like, I, I still need to watch, you know, My Neighbor Totoro. I need to check out Ponyo. I like to check out Porco Rosso. And, and I do have, I don't think that it's Hayao Miyazaki, but I do have Grave of the Fireflies in my disturbing movie collection. And that, yeah, that's a very, very powerful movie. But yeah, Princess Mononoke. And our Mikeversary episode is going to be his Masters of Horror episode imprint, which was banned from television at the time. <laughs> Fuck yeah. It's an okay episode, but you'll hear our thoughts on that when we celebrate our anniversary. And then we're going to actually end the season with a 90s kick. We're going to do So I Married an Axe Murderer with the St. Yeah. Paul film cast. And then we are going to end the season with episode 12, Sidekicks, featuring Chuck Norris and Jonathan Brandis. And (laughs) that is like the most 90s of 90s movies. It really is. And it's actually a pretty okay movie, especially for being directed by the guy that directed all the Walker, Texas Ranger episodes. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Norris. That's Chuck Norris's brother. Oh, fuck yeah. Okay. And our 420 special this year will be Evil Bong, and we will have the Hush Hush Conspiracy Hour on that one. And aren't we going to be doing the Uncharted movie at some time as a collaboration? Yeah, so this list is not exhaustive of what, uh, at the movies episodes we may do, Uncharted is something that's planned a collaboration with Collateral Gaming. I definitely want to talk about a few of the MCU films, Spider-Man No Way Home, Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. Oh, definitely Multiverse of Madness. That's going to be awesome. With the return of Sam Raimi. Oh, yes, that's going to be amazing. No Way Home we have to talk about because it quite possibly features Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield. That, that's going to be... Rumors are to be believed. Yeah, that's going to be really exciting to see all that. And, and they are to be believed, I think. <laughs> yeah, it, at least I would like to think so. And yeah, if that if, if those come out... I mean, I know Spider-Man's coming out during the season. I mean, I'm sure I want to I do the, the Thor Love and Thunder because Taika Waititi, you gotta... Oh, yeah, of course, man. Guardians Volume 3. Um, yeah, James Gunn. <laughs> exactly. All these great directors that are uh, attached to this universe, you know? Yeah. And of course, yeah, the James Gunn movies are the best. They're the best movies out of the entire MCU. You think so? Yeah. They're, they're him, among him, the best. Him and Taika Waititi, they do the best. That I'll, that, yeah. that, that I'll agree with. Yeah, Thor Ragnarok and Guardians of the Galaxy are... Uh, they're classic movies. Yeah. They're very classic, very funny movies. Two, two of my favorites. Yeah, definitely. But... Anyways, yeah, that's going to be season five of Collateral Cinema. So next episode will be Scream, which is going to be getting a reboot very soon. That's going to be exciting. And maybe that can be an at the theater episode for us. Yeah, for sure. 
That'd be interesting. And like I said, we're going to have Stu from SWO Productions on that. And that's going to be interesting. And we are also going to be on his next episode, which is going to be on Blade, the original movie with Wesley Snipes. Fuck yeah. I have a lot of love for, even though some of the graphics haven't really aged well. It's still like the first really good Marvel movie. Yeah. That's what I really see it as. And, you know, Wesley Snipes, he was good. He was awesome as Blade. He was great. The original, man. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what Mahershala Ali does. But, you know, Wesley Snipes' performance is going to be big shoes to fill. Yeah, definitely. And we're also going to be doing another Victims and Villains Awareness-a-thon later on this month. Fuck yeah, we are. We're going to be live streaming. I'm not entirely sure what we're going to do yet. We'll, we'll come. We'll, find, we'll figure it out last minute. Maybe probably last minute. You know, we, <laughs> we pretty much decided to just do new, another Bo Derek movie just out of the blue. We're just like, you know, fuck it. Let's just do it. You know? <laughs> That, that's how we do it. Once again, sorry, Captain. Yeah, well. <laughs> we, we try to put some effort into this, you know. We got to be collateral cinema. We know? got to, you yeah, know. Yeah, bring the yeah. vibe. Yeah, that's just, that's just how we roll. That's here. how we roll. Maybe we should do a good movie this time, though. What do you think? A good movie? I'm down. You're down? I'm totally down. Let, yeah. yeah, we'll have to figure something out. Or maybe even maybe we can even do some type of list or something. I don't know. Uh, or we could do Breen. Do a Breen movie? Could do a Breen movie. What, what Breen movie should we do? We're already doing Double Down. Oh. So what's left? Twisted Pair. Twisted Pair? Let's find Twisted Pair. Let's do it. Yeah, all right. Okay, yeah. Honestly, tell us what you think. Should we do Twisted Pair by Neil Breen on the awareness a thon? Should we do Cool Cat? Should we do Cool Cat? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you're going to bring Daddy Derek on us, man. Daddy Derek. Daddy, yes. Daddy Derek. <laughs> Oh, Daddy Derek. <laughs> oh, Lord. That I, Honestly, I would be interested in doing that, but let's save that for the main podcast because <laughs> that's going to be a fun episode. <laughs> that will be a hilarious. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and start wrapping things up here. Ash, what's going on with Collateral Gaming? Woo-wee! Well, as I'm actively working on the finale two-part episode on Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls, but actually in the reverse order, after that, we are starting up season four of Collateral Gaming. This month, we are going to be, first of all, discussing Metroid Dread. I'm really excited to talk about that. That's something, you know, it's the first new 2D Metroid game in 19 years. I'm a huge Metroid fan. I mean, for me, that's right behind Zelda, which is my favorite. So that's going to be fun. And we've also got our Halloween special coming out on Outlast. Uh, and then after which we will wrap up our discussion of Metroid Dread. I actually would like to be on the Outlast episode. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, I've at least seen enough uh, gameplay of it to kind of get what it's about and everything. So, yeah, I, I, I'd like to be on that episode. That'd Fuck be interesting. Yeah, all right. Just as a special guest, not a collaboration. Right. <laughs> I'm a special guest. But yeah, Collateral Cinema can be found on Patreon. We have $1 tiers and we have $5 tiers. I mean, give however much you wish, honestly. Yeah. Like, we don't care. We just want patrons. <laughs> either, either way, you'll get the benefit of our exclusive full-length movie commentaries. Yeah, we're going to do exclusive ones that you can't find anywhere else. I mean, we do free movie commentaries every now and again on the Collateral Cinema Director's Director's Cut, Cut. which is fun, and we might have to do one here pretty soon. But, yeah, that's going to be more specifically focused, I think, on the the low-budget cinema, whereas, you know, on the Patreon, we may do movies that we're talking about. We may do completely other things. Yeah. So... It's a lot of fun just to hear us ramble along to, wait, what the fuck? Is this fucking Caligula? That's Caligula, exactly. I have that movie right here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Motherfucking Caligula, bitch. How Caligula, the fuck bitch. T- well, you know, we're just, we're discussing disturbing movies. You know, that that's the YouTube videos yeah. that are playing, so <laughs> that makes sense. Yep, fucking Caligula with old Malcolm McDowell and everything, and Peter O'Toole and Helen Mirren. And Helen Mirren. Helen fucking Mirren and all the penthouse pets. So many penthouse <laughs> pets. Because Guccione was all over that shit. But anyway, yeah, check us out on Patreon. Collateral Cinema can be found on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and find us on Good Pods. Follow us and give us as many listens as you can. Maybe we could rise up on the leaderboard there. Also, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and 
and wherever else you get your podcasts. So Heck check yeah. us out there. And yeah, season five is now officially underway. What do you think, Ash? I'm super excited, man. Yeah, five seasons of this shit, man. It's five it's, seasons, and, and we're getting ever so close to nine thousand downloads, which means that we're ever so closer to the big ten thousand. So help us out, ladies and gentlemen. Give us as many downloads and listens as you can on whatever app that you wish. So check us out. Uh, I guess that that is going to be it. Season five, here we come. I'm Bo Maddox. And I'm Ashley Chancellor. And this is Collateral Cinema, season five. Fuck Stick- yeah, season five. Fuck yeah, season five. Fuck yeah, sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. Fuck yeah, sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, you God, son of a bitch. God damn it. Laters, everyone. Cinema is a collateral media podcast. All music and movie clips are owned by the respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor.